This is BBC Two for the Midlands. Ronnie Piles is returning to Birmingham University where 60 years ago his father helped create the atomic bomb. Together with another refugee scientist he made a discovery that would end the war. This is the story of two men whose work took them from this building to ground zero, from Birmingham to Hiroshima. Five hard years working on the right side of wrong. Now it's just part of the syllabus at Birmingham University, but 60 years ago there was still much we didn't understand about the atom. In February 1940, two physicists from this department, Otto Robert Frisch and Rudolf Pahls, were about to make one key breakthrough. In order to, to appreciate the significance of what my father and, and, and Frisch did, uh, you have to sort of go back and think of what it takes to make an atomic bomb and what people already knew about it at the time they started working. People had speculated about the possibility of an atomic bomb ever since the, the discovery of fission, which, which was the, the recognition that a uranium nucleus, if it was bombarded with a neutron, could break apart. And that introduced the possibility of a chain reaction. And a lot of people were thinking about how a bomb could be made by using this, this mechanism. One issue was how much uranium would you need? The initial assumption was that you'd need tons of the stuff and that that was quite impossible. Now there was one other possibility because although ordinary uranium that's true for, there's another kind of uranium. Ordinary uranium is uranium-238. There's another kind of uranium, U-235, which has three less neutrons in it. People had realized that this other form of uranium, the U-235, which occurs only about 1% of the time in natural uranium, would be a better candidate for making a bomb or making a chain reaction because it didn't absorb and waste so many of the neutrons which were produced in the fission. Scientists knew this but couldn't get beyond the assumption that just like uranium-238, you would need tons of the rarer uranium-235 to make a bomb. It was here at Birmingham that Frisch and Piles overcame that mental block. Frisch asked Piles to work out just how much uranium-235 it would take. It was a calculation no one else had thought to do. Scribbling on the back of an envelope, they made a shocking discovery. And the answer came out to be surprisingly small. They said that they figured it would be about a golf ball sized piece of uranium. Only a pound or two would be needed. Speaking shortly before he died, Rudolf Piles described what they did next. On the back of another envelope, we tried to estimate what would be the effect what would be the energy release. And we couldn't get an exact figure for that, but it was clear that this was tremendous. This was very large. And then we said, good heavens, if we could think of this, then the, the Nazi Germans must have been able to see that. And if they are the first to get such a weapon, God help us. They took that science and condensed it down into this three-page typewritten document. It's entitled, On the Construction of a Super Bomb, based on a nuclear chain reaction in uranium. Nuclear physicists today call this the Frisch Piles Memorandum. And it's this document, which was typed in Birmingham and is now stored here in the Public Records Office in Kew in London, that leads directly to the creation of the atomic bomb. So who were these men? Monica Frisch returned to the room where her father worked. Goodness. Very typical. Just the sort of place my father would have loved. His books always talk about how he, he, he made scientific equipment from whatever he could find. He, this sort of equipment that's sort of just made out of yeah, some rough planks and yeah, some obviously very carefully sort of machine bits of perspex. Otto Robert Frisch was born in 1904 in Vienna, a mathematical prodigy whose father was a publisher and mother a concert pianist. My father was an incredibly humane man. He liked words, he was good with language, he was a very talented musician. Music was very important to him, he played the piano every day. I 
can't imagine him not doing so. With the rise of the Nazis, Jewish scientists were banned from German universities. My father wasn't very interested in politics. He was, I think in some ways he was the, the proverbial scientist in the ivory tower. Science was what fascinated him. Science was what he wanted to do. To do that, Frisch left Germany and in 1934 arrived in Copenhagen to work with Nobel Prize winner Niels Bohr. The work on the atom bomb wasn't my father's most important work. I think his joint discovery of fission with his great aunt Lisa Meitner probably was a, a genuine outstanding scientific achievement. I think I best quote what I wrote to my mother a few days later when I said I feel like a man who has caught an elephant by the tail in the middle of a jungle and doesn't quite know what to do with it. But I knew it was an elephant. Still grappling with that elephant, Frisch arrived in Birmingham. It wasn't safe in Germany and it, it soon became clear that it wasn't going to be safe in Denmark either. And, you know, so he'd been asking around, looking for somewhere in England where he could be. Already in Birmingham was another German-Jewish refugee, Professor Rudolf Piles, who as a student had also worked with Niels Bohr. Three years younger than Frisch, Piles had studied under Heisenberg, the man who would later try and fail to make the German atomic bomb. He met his wife Jenya at a conference in Leningrad. Ronnie was their second child. So, the family home? Oh, this is quite amazing. It must be uh, 60 years since I was last coming in here. I was... Oh, well, I'll give it a try, yes. My goodness. In my mind's eye, I thought of, of that our bedroom was on the, on the right, but as I look at this, I think it must have been this one, because there, would have a fire, there was a fireplace in the middle. I don't remember very clearly. He was a very was there, natural, was very ordinary kind of person. He loved practical things, fixing things around the house, he loved explaining things. It wasn't until I was much, much older that I had any idea of how, how distinguished he was in his, in his field. Otto Frisch became a friend to the Pilses and moved into their home in Edgbaston. It could well have been in this house that they did their first calculations for the atomic bomb. Science has its own timetable and, and there is no way that they would have gone and discussed it at the university and then stopped when they came home. And especially something as, as, uh, which was as both intellectually and politically uh, extraordinary as what they were beginning to find out and discover about the possibilities of, of, of an atomic bomb. I think it's quite certain that they must have continued to discuss it here. They took their findings to their head of department, Mark Oliphant. He was already in charge of the top secret research on radar, and it was he who asked them to write the memorandum. But there's more to this memorandum than just physics. There's a second section, and in it, Frisch and Piles have looked at the implications of using an atomic bomb. They say that if a bomb was dropped, radioactive substances would spread with the wind, killing large numbers of civilians, in other words, nuclear fallout. And further down the page, they discuss the idea of what sort of defence there would be once a country, especially the enemy, had acquired the nuclear bomb. They say there are simply no effective deterrents unless a counter-threat with a similar bomb was considered. You'd thought through all the moral and political implications of what you're doing, as well as the science. Well, I mean, this seems to me rather natural that once you have the idea that you would think about the, all these consequences. One of the first people they shared their work with was a Polish scientist who fled when the Germans invaded his country. In early 1940, Joseph Rotblat was also experimenting with nuclear fission. Uh, they came both to, uh, to my Dixon room and they showed me the memorandum and he talked about it. We became very engrossed in it. What I have been so guessing at, that a bomb might be possible, yet now I acquire, suddenly I quite realistic uh, sort of perceptions about it. This means something can be done. At the same time, it made me also even more worried than before, and the German scientists may make the bomb. What was extraordinary about the secret memo was how far ahead of the Americans and Germans it placed the British bomb. The British government had already dismissed the idea of a nuclear chain reaction as a weapon, but the Frisch-Piles memorandum led to a rapid and complete rethink. 
Shortly after receiving the Frisch Pals memorandum, the government set up a committee to study the idea of building an atomic bomb. These are the minutes of the first meeting, and there were five people present, including two scientists from Birmingham University, Professor Oliphant and Dr. Moon. Now, the presence of these scientists shows how important research underway at Birmingham was going to be in every aspect of constructing an atomic bomb. And it wasn't just physics. Professor Howarth, the head of chemistry at the university and a Nobel Prize winner, was soon drawn into the project. Colin Tatlow was a young chemistry graduate. Howarth picked him to work out how to handle uranium hexafluoride, the starting point for separating out the few pounds of uranium-235 needed to make a bomb. But the gas seemed almost unusable. This attacked vigorously all the standard uh, lubricants and all the sort of things that were used, rubbers and so on, in um, plants, chemical plants, in those days as now. So, as part of the terrific enterprise that was necessary in this uh, atomic work, uh, these new chemicals had to be developed. When not working in the laboratory, everyone from students to professors served in the Home Guard or the city's fire service. Everybody worked very hard, you know, till all hours of the, of the night, really, because they felt they owed it to the ones who, who were fighting. I know this sounds very really trite, but I think this was very much a consideration for, for all of us. The bomb project was now clearly too large for the university alone. It was codenamed Tube Alloys and turned over to ICI. Staff at the company's vast ammunition factory in Witten, North Birmingham, were drawn into the continuing problem of separating out the uranium-235. It started in May 1941. I had no idea that there was an atomic bomb or could be an atomic bomb. It just happened to be a curious coincidence that I was in a place where the manager of the search department could come and chat to me. They needed to filter the uranium hexafluoride gas through thousands of membranes, each with holes smaller than any produced before. They turned to Michael Clapham, a printer adept at creating images from tiny dots. Um, this is a file of the stuff that wasn't destroyed and contains a few things you might like to look at. Oh my goodness. Goodness. Including a diffusion barrier. I'll give you a nickel one. Just give you some Can idea I? of what it looks like. This is one of the membranes? Yes. I asked Piles one day uh, how diffusion works. And Piles said, you know that great shot tire you have? I want you to imagine that someone has stretched a very coarse fishnet in layers a foot apart all the way down. I go up to the top of it, and in one hand I've got a box of golf balls, and on the other hand I've got a box of what you call shuttlecocks. You blow a whistle, I throw them both in. What do you expect to happen first at the bottom? And I said, well, I think shuttlecocks will wobble a bit in the air, so um, I expect more golf balls will find their way through first. So I expect a few more golf balls than shuttlecocks. He said, that's right. Do it a million, million times, and you'll have only golf balls, won't you? I was told to plan on an industrial scale for the pilot plant that was being built inside a poison gas factory. My wife thought that I was making poison gas. It made a very good cover for the project. Fourteen months after Frisch and Piles wrote their memorandum, the Maud Committee made its final report, recommending the government should build the bomb and including a calculation of the cost. This is ICI's estimate. It puts the cost of 36 atomic bombs at some eight and a half million pounds. And it then goes on to compare that with the cost of the equivalent amount of TNT. And that works out at nearly twice as much. So already the government has both a military and now a financial imperative to move this research on as quickly as possible. But by then, Britain didn't have the money or the manpower to see the project through. The report was sent to America. Until that time, the Americans didn't do anything in this direction. They worked on fission, but on the peaceful applications, namely building reactors. Once again, Birmingham's head of physics, Mark Oliphant, had to force the pace. Visiting Washington to discuss radar, he was amazed to discover the report locked in a safe unread. He took it directly to President Roosevelt. All of a sudden, they opened their eyes. They said, 
well, this is something which, is, which needs to be done. And this is really where the Americans began with the Manhattan Project. By 1944, the Bonn Project, and with it Otto Frisch and the Piles family, had moved to Los Alamos in the United States. Boy, as you can imagine, we traveled out by train, by sleeper train, all the way from New York, and that was that was exciting. We went through security and guards and all the things which adults probably would tear their hair out about, but for a child was fun. For me, Los Alamos was, in a way, so I saw it as a scientist's paradise. If you wanted something, whatever it was, from a bicycle a chain to a cyclotron, all you had to do is to write out a little chit. And within a few days, it will be delivered to you. No questions asked. <laughs> and it's something which is quite unbelievable, you know, uh, and the conditions which, under which we were in, in England. And the second very great thing, point about Los Alamos was that there you met in flesh the people about whom you only read about, and for you they are the father figures and, and really idols. Here you could have uh, discussions with them, sit down for lunch with half a dozen Nobel laureates and, and talk with them as equals. This is really marvelous. But in Birmingham things weren't so wonderful. Michael Clapham lived in fear of the Germans beating them to the bomb and was refusing to let his wife and children return to their home in the city. I was reluctant to have her back in Birmingham because I knew we'd be a, a target if the Germans got there first. And when the news broke about the atomic bomb, she realized why I'd been reluctant to have her back. The Germans did have a secret weapon, the V2 rocket. The first one fell on London, a few streets away from where Michael Clapham was immersed in a meeting about the bomb project. We heard this tremendous crash and Wallace Akers said something to his secretary who went out of the room and he came back and said it's a rocket bomb that has fallen and we all heaved a sigh of relief it's only an ordinary bomb just delivered by a rocket it wasn't what we were all frightened of that night some of my colleagues and I went round to the pub in Great Broad Street and uh, consumed all the beer we could find in celebration there was no German bomb, but work at Los Alamos continued. Once the Germany was out, there was no reason to continue with the work, because it was fairly clear the Japanese were not working on it. So why didn't you stop at that point? Well, uh, it's very hard to know. I mean, it's very hard to answer. Uh, the one person who did stop at that point was Joe Rotblatt. He said he, he didn't want to go ahead with this. Uh, once there was no danger from Germany. But he was the only one. And, uh, well, the rest of us felt that here was a, there, there after all, uh, were very heavy losses going on in the war against Japan. And here we had the method, the, the weapon, that would certainly end the war and save all those lives. The test shot was originally scheduled for three in the morning but the weather broke the evening before and there were thunderstorms and we had to wait so I got very little sleep that night we were driven away to a distance of about 20 miles felt to be safe and uh, there we waited around getting uh, catnaps and in between listening to dance music broadcast from the loudspeakers and from time to time a voice would say the shot has been postponed another 20 minutes because of atmospheric disturbances and on went the dance music again. And, and then at last, about 4.30 if I remember rightly, came the countdown. And I of course had forgotten my dark goggles, so I turned round facing the other way. And um, as the countdown came to zero, the mountains suddenly were bathed in a brilliant light.
until if the sun had, uh, was shining, completely dazzling for several seconds. And then it began to get darker again, and I turned around and started blinking at the brilliant object that lay on the horizon. And gradually it started to rise and became less brilliant and became yellow and then red. And after a while it looked like a huge oil fire, sort of ball of fire with uh, waves in it. And a gray stalk of dust connecting it to the ground. And I watched it for about two or three minutes while it rose higher and higher and gradually became gray until in the end it looked like a thunderhead. Were you exhilarated at, at such a scientific triumph or were you fearful of its menace? Well, honestly, I was chiefly sleepy. Certainly very awe-inspiring to see the thing actually go off and see the flash of light and the emotional cloud. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. Scientists, British and American, have made the atomic bomb at last. The first one was dropped on a Japanese city this morning. I was turning on the nine o'clock news on the day the bomb dropped, and my old radiogram had gone out of order, and I couldn't hear it. And I said, oh, we'll forget the nine o'clock news for once. And then the telephone rang, and my sister said, is this atom bomb the thing you were working on? And I said, what atom bomb? And she said, they've dropped one on Japan. Haven't you heard the news? I said, I'll ring you later. I rushed back to our drawing room, pulled out the radiogram, got my ear to the wall, because the two old ladies who lived next door were rather deaf and kept our radio turned up. And I heard the end of the news story through the wall on my hands and knees. So it's not a moment you will forget. It was designed for a detonation equal to 20,000 tons of high explosives. Originally, in C-39, everybody was horrified by the idea of air raids on cities and killing pedestrians, killing civilians. And then, a few years later, you have the air raids on Hamburg, Dresden, Tokyo, and nobody turned a hair. It was simply that the public attitude had changed. And without that change, it might not have been so easy to justify the dropping of the atom bombs. But that, I think, was unnecessary. And therefore, therefore, uh, immoral. Then they came back to England. We became involved in a movement of scientists to prevent and the further use of the bomb. It gave one country an enormous superiority in arms, the nuclear monopoly. And they felt this will not stand idle. The Russians are bound to, to, to respond in a similar way. This is going to lead to a nuclear arms race. But the Russians already knew much more about the bomb than Norman who worked at Los Alamos suspected. One of the Birmingham scientists had betrayed his friends and colleagues and passed the secrets of the bomb to the Soviets. The spy was Klaus Fuchs, a close friend of the Pals family who lived with them in Birmingham and worked with them at Los Alamos. On his arrest in 1950, Genya Pals wrote to him in prison. For your cause, you did not have to be on such warm personal relations with them. These are the people that he was working with. To play with their children and dance and drink and talk. You are such a quiet man that you could have kept yourself much more aloof. You are enjoying the best of the world you are trying to destroy. It is not honest. And I think that just shows how betrayed that my parents felt. I think my mother felt it much more keenly 
than my father because my father was a scientist and things just happened. My mother was the one with the emotions and so she was the one that was hurt the most. In the hunt that unmasked Fuchs, Rudolf Paz was also a suspect and in 1957 he lost his security clearance. Almost 50 years later the issue re-emerged. Both husband and wife were accused of being the spies that appeared in the so-called Venona papers, codenamed Pears Vogel and Tina. I do not believe now uh, that his wife was uh, the spy codenamed Tina. Um, I was unaware at the time that uh, I studied Venona uh, that Tina had been positively identified. In the summer of 1999, Tina emerged blinking into the light, Melita Norwood, and there's no evidence to back up the claims against Sir Rudolph. In terms of natural justice, it doesn't even begin to put together uh, a case uh, for a court of law or even a case where you would want on the balance of probabilities to show guilt. Intelligence services are not interested in that. If you're dealing with national security, uh, you go to a completely different threshold of proof. He was married to a Russian. He had worked very closely with Klaus Fuchs. And so, yes, he should have been investigated. I, had to, I did actually go through a period where I doubted him where I actually thought to myself, is it possible? Is it, there, is it possible that he might have been a spy? I hate the people who made the allegations, mostly for making me doubt my father. I never, ever want to doubt him, because I believe very, very firmly he wasn't a spy. Monica Frisch believes her father's discovery remains a very real threat to the world. She's the new treasurer for the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. I used to occasionally hear people say things like, you know, if I can get my hands on the person who invented the bomb, and I'd keep very quiet, um, because I was very aware of my father's role. But the more I read about the experiences of people, of Jews, in the 30s in Austria and Germany, the more I can understand the fear that drove people like my father, Professor Rockblatt, Rudy Piles, you know, to feel that they, they had to at least let it be known that this weapon could be developed just in case Hitler was developing one. There's one interesting aspect of this whole memorandum and the calculation which actually says uh, quite a lot about, about science in general. Because there's a certain, in a certain sense, they actually got the calculation wrong. Partly deliberately because in order to get it done they left out a lot of the gory details which would have been much too complex and much too long term to calculate. Partly because in fact along the way they made some actual mistakes which uh, even, even within the approximations they used were probably not strictly correct. So the actual number of a pound, which is what they, they mentioned in the memorandum, uh, is in fact too small.